So in this video, we're going to apply our technique of artificial neural networks to handwriting recognition. Um, this is a standard problem in machine learning, and I'm sure you'll encounter it further um, if, you, uh, if, if you are interested in machine learning and continue to, to learn more about it. Um, so this is recognition of handwritten digits, much like you would um, fill out on a, on a government form, which is then read in by, a, um, a, by an optical character recognition machine. So we'll download this data set. Um, again, scikit-learn has a function for that, for that fetch machine learning data, um, and we'll download the original MNIST um, modified NIST data set. Um, so that's it, it's already loaded. Um, it may take a little bit longer for you um, if you do this the first time around. So we'll split this up in a training and test data set. So the first 60,000 entries are going to be training um, and the last entries will be uh, test data sets. I'll also divide the values by 255 because the way this is encoded is there are pixel values that are, integ that are integer, integer grayscales between 0 and 255, so I'm going to turn that into a real number between 0 and 1, um, and I'll just keep the, um, the target um, unchanged except for that permutation to shuffle the data. So all of the data um, entries are 28 by 28 pixels. Uh, so for a 784 linear um, pixel values uh, that have those grayscale values. So we can reshape those, let's say for entry four um, in our training data set, we'll reshape those back into a 28 by 28 matrix um, and we can um, show that matrix and then also look at the correct classification that is in our training data set so one of the thing, you know, this one, for example, is the number seven, um, and indeed the classification in um, the Y values and the target for a training data set is seven. Um, we could go to a, a different entry here, and we'd find a different number. This is the number nine, and indeed the target is stored as nine, um, and we've got a, a poorly drawn five here. Um, so this is apparently um, in our training data set as the number of five. Now, using traditional approaches, you might wonder, okay, how am I going to ever be able to identify this number five? I would have to write um, a couple of very strange rules to be able to identify that number of five. Maybe you can count the number of, of turns in, the, um, in, in the, the way the number is drawn, but then maybe some, sometimes it won't recognize this as a turn correctly you can imagine that this will be very difficult. So what we'll do is we'll just create a, an artificial neural network um, that has a hidden layer of 100 nodes, 100 neurons, an input layer of those 784 pixels, um, and then an output layer that will tell us what the number is. Uh, so it's going to be 10 probability values as a classifier. So I'm using here now this multi-layer perceptron classifier with a hundred hidden, uh, uh, one layer with a hundred, um, one hidden layer with a hundred neurons. Um, and I'm going to use as activation function this um, relune, so the, the uh, rec rectified um, linear unit. So actually one of the things we could do is instead of using this, let's start with linear, um, sorry, with identity, which is the, the linear function. So we'll start with that. Um, as you can see here, as the solver, um, I've used stochastic gradient descent, which we've also talked about already. And as a tolerance, I'm using um, 10 to the minus three, so not the default 10 to the minus four, because it might take a while to, um, to converge. The other parameters, maximum number of iterations, so I'm going to do at most 40 iterations. Um, because this is a fairly large data set, each iteration itself will take a, a fairly long time. And the other parameters are just picked here um, so that we can get convergence fairly quickly um, within this uh, um, within this uh, this video. So we'll set up our neural network um, and we'll fit it. So okay, first iteration, second iteration. So we'll go through a couple of iterations. Remember, you were using an identity activation here, um, so this isn't necessarily going to be the best. Um, 
the best way to, to train this network, but we'll come back and then we'll use this rectified linear unit and we'll see that we get much better results with that because of the introduction of, uh, of nonlinearity. So we're going down on our loss curve here. Um, we should probably be close to convergence here, okay? So we are converged at 0 0.26. We started off at 0 0.36. Um, we can look at our plot of our loss curve again. So for the each training iteration, we go down a little bit. And so after 16 iterations, um, we reached our 17 iterations, we reached our, um, our best um, loss function, loss curve. Okay. Um, we can look at our accuracy on our training set and then our test set. Um, and this will return a value between zero and one, where uh, one would be 100% accurate, uh, uh, 100 accurate um, classification, and zero would be, of course, 100% incorrect. Um, so we see that we get 93% correct on the training data set and 92% on the test set. Okay, so that's not bad for um, a, a set of, uh, um, of over 60,000 um, handwritten numbers where uh, sometimes the numbers might even be difficult for us to recognize. Um, we can look at um, the, the output um, for a prediction. So let's use our trained neural network to predict the probabilities for some of our test data. So we'll look at the first 16 um, test data points. And I'll plot those here in a four by four um, uh, plot. And so on the um, x-axis, we have the numbers from zero to, to nine. And on the y-axis, we have each time the probability. So here we have 100% probability for the number four, um, zero for all the others. What you see is that there's some values here where this is a fairly large probability for some of the other values. So here, um, there's about 25% probability that it's a six, even though there's over 50% probability that there's a two. Um, so it, it's not as sure about some of these values as it could be. Um, we could say something about the ratio of the highest probable to the next most probable. Um, and we could use it as a, um, a sort of a confidence in the prediction for the highest probable um, event. Uh, but we would prefer this to be even clearer, even cleaner. Actually, if you look at this one here, um, these probabilities are almost identical um, for those two neighboring points. Um, okay, we'll come back to that and we'll see how that changes when we use one of those nonlinear activation functions, the ReLU um, uh, rectified linear unit um, activation function. We can look at our um, or, or weights, um, the coefficients that we fit. So of course our first, la first set of coefficients will be from layer zero, the input layer with our 784 pixels to our 100 neurons in the hidden layer. And then we have 100 to 10 um, in the output layer. So the 10 output um, values are the probabilities. So that's a large number of coefficients. So we're not gonna plot them uh, we're not going to print them to the screen, but one of the things we can do is we can use our matrix show um, graphical output. So what we'll do is we'll just plot those 10 by 10, so 100 matrices that give the, um, the weights from the input image to um, the hidden layer. Um, so that will be 100 different matrices in that first layer. It'll take a while to plot because it's, after all, a hundred um, matrices that are each um, 28 by 28. So you can see what uh, um, what the weights are. There's not a whole lot to be deduced from that, other than you know they they look different. Um, in the the first node of our hidden layer, um, this is the weights that are associated with each of the pixels in our input image, um, and so those weights are are then all summed and through a linear activation function um, are turned into a single value, right? Then that value goes through the next set of weights. So from our first node, it goes through another 10 weights to give output into um, the probability for this to be number one, uh, zero, one, two, through nine. So that's what these numbers are. That's, those are the weights 
in our second matrix from our 100 hidden nodes to our 10 output nodes. Um, so we could, since we're working in a linear matrix here, we could now of course multiply all of those weights in the output uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in, in the connection between the hidden layer to the output layer with the weights in our input layer to the hidden layer um, and just sum them just to the matrix multiplication take into account our intercepts um, and essentially this is what we would get um, so s again remember what we're doing here is um, because we have a linear activation function we can just um, do the matrix multiplication and have um, all the inputs immediately go into um, the, be immediately multiplied into the outputs. So this is what we have here. Each, um, each value for the targets could give me a, a, a different plot here. Um, and give you the weights for a target equal to zero. So if there is a zero, um, th this will, if I multiply this pixel by pixel with the uh, input pixels, then um, I should get the probability or the output of this um, neural network for um, for for zero for the class zero and of course then I would have to do the same for class one class two all the way through nine and then compare which one is most likely to be the right output so there's not a lot to be seen from this um, which indicates that uh, oftentimes with neural networks you get a lot of coefficients but you don't necessarily have the same kind of insight in them um, as you would get from linear regression so all of this now we've done with our linear model, right? Um, so now let's go back and let's turn, um, turn off the linear model and instead use our, um, our different um, model. Let's use what we could try with logistic. Um, so we'll start with logistic. We have to train our, um, our, our uh, um, neural network. So we'll start at a larger loss um, but we'll go down. Um, so one of the problems with the, the logistic regression uh, or with the logistic activation function I said before is that if we start with zero weights um, we'll have relatively bad predictions so that's why we start with a larger loss here. Um, so as you can see the, um, the loss function is going down and down and down um, and we'll end when we reach the, the tolerance of uh, 10 to the minus 3 uh, we're still using stochastic gradient descent. We haven't changed our number of uh, internal layers. Um, so we'll see how many iterations um, this will take. So because this is a nonlinear function, this may go a little bit slower than, um, the, than, than what we had for, um, uh, for the linear function. So nowadays, when you run this in, uh, in the cloud, um, on, on, for example, Google Collaboratory, you have the opportunity to run this on GPUs. Um, and you'll notice that if you enable GPUs, this may run um, quite a bit faster, in particular also because some of those nonlinear functions have been implemented there in, in fairly efficient ways, um, and, but mainly because of the parallelization. OK, so we've reached convergence here after 38 iterations. We can look at our plot. Um, so uh, the, the loss curve has indeed gone down and reached, um, reached a plateau there. We can look at our test scores and look at what we had before we introduced the nonlinear function. So we had 93% accuracy on the training set and 92 on the test set. Um, so if we look at that now for logistic, we get 99.7% um, accuracy on the training set and 97.6% on the test set. So 97.6% of the data that we haven't trained on um, was correctly identified by this, uh, by this nonlinear function instead of only about 90% in the case of a linear, um, linear model. So that really indicates that there's a benefit here for using, um, uh, using these nonlinear functions. We can look at those same first 16 test events and see whether we get better results. Um, and as you can see, most of those side peaks, those other peaks where there was some probability that the number was not um, in the, the mode of the, um, the distribution, uh, so th all of those have disappeared with the exception maybe of this small bump here, which is less than 10% uh, um, likely. 
Uh, we can look at our, our um, weights. Of course, that hasn't changed. The values of the weights have changed because we fitted a different function to it. Um, but we're not going to be able to tell a whole lot from those um, weights. Uh, so this is what we have now as our weights. It's just a way, a convenient way to look at, um, at the values. One of the things you might notice is that typically in each of those weight matrices, the weights of the, of the um, pixels on the outside of the image are not as valuable. The weights are largest on the inside and the, the inner regions of the image and that's of course because that's where most of the information about the number is. There's no information about the number in these outside pixels so that's where we just get a uniform um, gray area. Um, and then of course the layer from the hidden layer to the output layer contains just as little information. Um, I could multiply these matrices back together but of course here that doesn't mean anything at all um, in particular because there's these uh, nonlinear functions that are being applied in between each step. So that's what we got for um, for the logistic regression, so 99.7 um, for the training set and 97.6 for the test data set. So now we can do the last thing um, and instead of using logistic we'll use this rectified linear unit which essentially is on one half, um, one side it's, um, it's a linear function uh, on the on the positive z side and on the negative z side it's a step function so it's it's very easy to um, evaluate uh, and it's very easy to calculate um, not as difficult as uh, these uh, um, uh, logistic functions for example where we have to do exponentials um, but still the nonlinearity in that function will give us a lot better results even though um, it, it's actually very similar to a, a linear function to the identity uh, the, the fact that we have a hard cutoff at zero, uh, we have a threshold there where the behavior really changes, allows the neural network to, um, to, to exploit that feature and um, to really uh, use it to uh, um, distinguish the, um, the, the different handwritten numbers in, in a better way. So we can look again at our training curve. As you see, the loss goes down. Goes down. Um, and we can look at our accuracies um, and you see with the rectified linear uh, on our training set we get 99.995 um, correct uh, answers of course it's our training set so um, we're uh, we're actually training for this and uh, instead of 96 97.6 we got we now get 97.8 um, percent accuracy on our uh, on our test data so uh, um, if I look at these first 16 events again, um, you'll see that all of them are now uh, identified in just a single digit. So even here where we had our little bump before, um, that ambiguity is gone and everything is predicted. It's 100% um, probability for this digit to be um, 4. So that indicates the importance of, uh, of trying out a couple of different um, uh, activation functions and really building some kind of feeling for which kind of activation functions are good um, for which kind of problem. So um, we could look at our um, weights going into the input layer uh, because that will give us some, um, gives, gives me a little bit of a, a segue into what's going to be the topic for the next class and that is can we do this um, calculation with our pixels, can we do this better? Can we somehow um, exploit the information that is that is present in um, the, the shifts, the relative shifts that someone might draw um, a, a number? Uh, so someone might draw their, their number seven just a little bit more to the left or a little bit more to the right. Um, in this case, our neural network isn't able to really pick up those, um, those changes. Uh, it, it has to train for essentially number seven that are drawn anywhere in, uh, in that 28 by 28 pixel um, field. Uh, and it, it has to train for that without any generality about what does a number seven look like. So what we'll do in the next lecture is use another expansion of our artificial neural network um, toolkit and we'll, uh, we'll use convolutional neural networks which will draw 
uh, which will um, um, also include some of the information we've talked about before when we talked about digital signal processing and convolutions of, um, of signals with, uh, with other signals. So that's what we'll use um, in a graphical imaging context um, be, um, when we go to, uh, to the next topic of convolutional neural network layers. Okay, but that's it for, um, uh, for today. So think about some of the ways you can, um, you might be able to apply these kind of techniques, these neural network techniques um, in your own work, in your own research, um, in your own majors. Uh, so obviously, as you can see, um, it will be beneficial if you have a larger amount of data so you can really train the neural network to be generally applicable. Um, but, uh, but I'm sure you m may be able to think of some, um, some examples. Okay, talk to you next time.